Good morning, everyone. It's Friday, which means we'll be covering our, our weekly education update, as well as a health update from Dr. Levine. Before we get to that, I want to comment on the situation in Michigan, where the FBI and state and local law enforcement uncovered a plot to take over the Capitol, take hostages, including the governor, and to attack law enforcement and first responders, including a state police facility. This news, which appears driven by intense and deep polarization, is shocking and disturbing, and is why all of us need to find a way to heal the deep divisions in our country. To start, this type of activity and violence of any kind should be universally condemned. Elected officials across the country, but especially at the top, must realize that words matter. We all need to be aware that violent groups exist, and we must stop the rhetoric that incites this path to violence. We all must do better, because our kids are watching, and they're learning from us. And we're reaching a boiling point in this country, so it's up to all of us to lower the temperature. In closing, I want to send my thoughts to Governor Whitmer, her family and staff, and all those in Michigan. And I want to thank the federal, state, and local law enforcement officers who put their own safety at risk every day and prevented this from becoming an incredible tragedy. It's an important reminder of the importance of public safety and law enforcement in this country. Now, there's no easy way to transition from that to an update on our schools, but I'll give it a try. We're exactly one month into the school year. So we want to reflect on all the hard work that has made the returning to school possible. As well, remind folks of what we must do to keep our schools open in order to have in-person learning both continue and expand. First and foremost, I want to thank school board members, superintendents, principals, teachers, school staff, bus drivers, and the maintenance staff for all you've done to make school reopening go so smoothly this fall. I also want to thank kids, parents, uh, and others for your patience and understanding. Going all the way back uh, to the end of last school year and this summer as state and local leaders have worked together to get this right. As you may know, we've had a few cases of COVID linked to schools in the last month, and we're certainly not out of the woods when it comes to this virus. But when these situations have occurred, as we knew they would, school leaders have responded quickly and worked closely with the Department of Health and Agency of Education to prevent in-school transmission. I think we all agree there's no substitute for in-person learning, so the fact that we're getting this right, getting kids back into the classroom with their peers, and managing the risks of this virus is one of the proudest achievements since all this began. And most of the credit belongs to all of you, everyday Vermonters doing the right thing. With a month under our belts, we're hearing of more and more schools increasing the amount of in-person instruction they're offering. This is exactly what we had hoped for, proving schools can reopen safely, which increases the amount of time kids can be in the classroom. Secretary French and the Agency of Education have sent a survey out to districts, which will let us know where all our schools are uh, right now uh, in terms of uh, weaning off from hybrid learning. But what I'm hearing anecdotally and through the media is more schools opening their doors physically. We'll have the results of that survey uh, for you next week at this briefing. I also want to reiterate our schools uh, reflect the surroundings. If the virus is suppressed in the community, it keeps the risk of an outbreak in uh, the school low. So as Dr. Fauci told us three weeks ago, we must remain vigilant. That means wearing a mask, keeping six feet of distance, washing your hands a lot, staying home when sick. And one more I'll add to all of that, consider getting a flu shot this year. As we continue to manage this crisis and consider how to come out of it stronger than before, I think this pandemic has made it clear how essential public education and childcare is. It's important to our families, our economy, and to the daily fabric of our lives. 
So before I turn it over to Secretary French, I also want to recognize our child care and early learning system. Those who stepped up from the get-go to make sure essential workers had care for their kids and then quickly stepped up again when schools began to reopen to fill gaps on remote learning days. We know we have a long way to go to make our pre-K to, to 12 system more coordinated with after school, child care, and early education. But we've taken some steps forward in this pandemic that could help us in the future. With that, uh, Secretary French. Uh, thank you, Governor. Uh, good morning. Our COVID-19 case count remains low, and to date we have not seen any transmission of the virus in our schools. Uh, Commissioner Pichak uh, includes the aggregated school data in his regular Tuesday updates, and you can also uh, find these data on the Department of Health website. Our schools continue to settle in with the implementation of our health guidance as expected. Uh, we are seeing more schools move to more in-person and learning. Uh, for example, Burlington announced this week that its elementary schools are moving to four days a week in-person instruction, um, and other schools in the Chittenden County region are doing the same. Mill River, uh, which is just south of Rutland, recently announced it's moving to in-person instruction as well. <clears throat> Mill River has been completely remote since schools opened uh, last month. Starting on the 19th, uh, Mill River students in grades pre-K through 4 will have instru uh, in-person instruction five days a week, and students in grades 5 and 6 will follow uh, starting five days a week on November 2nd. Uh, students in Mill River in grades 7 and 12 will be under a hybrid model. I had a call uh, with Superintendent John Castle, the North Country Supervisory Union this week. Uh, North Country is one of our largest supervisory unions uh, from a geographic perspective. Uh, it stretches from North Troy on the Canadian border through Newport, down to Lowell, Jay, over to Charleston, and Island Pond or Brighton. According to Superintendent Castle, he thinks things are going very well. Um, he ran into one of his kindergarten teacher, teachers at the recycling center over this weekend and she said, quote unquote, it almost feels normal. I think things are starting to feel more normal in our districts because of all the hard work people put into the preparations this summer. Uh, they've planned well and now feeling more comfortable operating their schools in these conditions. Even with the vaccine, however, I expect our schools will be operating with these necessary precautions for some time, if not for the remainder of the school year. So it's important that we maximize opportunities for in-person instruction now when the conditions are very positive to do so. As the governor mentioned, we are implementing a monthly data collection to monitor the trends for in-person learning and hybrid learning over time. Uh, we sent out the first survey last week, and I expect to be able to provide some reporting on those results uh, next week. Also, uh, our task force behind the creation of the health guidance uh, has been meeting to consider rev revisions to that health guidance. I expect we'll be issuing revised guidance by the end of October, uh, but we're also trying to address issues now uh, that would benefit from great, greater clarity. Uh, one of the issues that came up this week had to do with the distancing guidance uh, that currently applies to students in grades pre-K through five. Uh, based on some feedback from the educators on the task force, we went ahead and expanded that distancing uh, to include grade six. Our sports task force, led by Secretary Moore, uh, has been meeting to work on our upcoming winter sports guidance. Uh, most winter sports are held indoors, so the considerations are more complex and perhaps more problematic uh, than the fall sports. Complexity of this work has led the group to conclude uh, that this guidance will be published at the end of October rather than October 15th as originally planned. This means practices for winter sports will likely start after Thanksgiving and games and competitions will likely begin after the first of the year. The winter sports guidance will have a similar structure to the fall sports guidance uh, in that it will include provisions that are general to all winter sports as well as guidance that is specific to each sport. In terms of sports specific guidance, at this point I'm not optimistic about our ability to uh, allow wrestling and indoor track this winter. Uh, wrestling is problematic due to the high degree of physical contact uh, indoor track has the challenge of having a large number of participants indoors uh, during their meets. The task force is still working on finding a path forward for allowing other winter sports, including basketball and hockey. 
Uh, the task force is working on how to mitigate the risks associated with these sports. Once again, I expect our guidance for winter sports to be published at the end of the month. Uh, that concludes my update. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Levine. Good morning. As of last evening, we stand at 1,838 cases. Continue to have no more deaths above the 58 we've announced previously. There were no inpatients on the report this morning and one person under investigation. We continue to uh, look at regional data, some of which you saw on Tuesday. Both regional data and especially Midwest data indicate that there are states that have had increases in cases and in some cases increases in hospitalizations. When looking at the region, I take special note of Boston, New York, Connecticut, Rhode Island, New Jersey, both in the categories of cases and hospitalizations. You've heard a lot about our very successful experience with K through 12, which I won't reiterate here. Um, but over the last two weeks, we've only seen a small number of uh, college cases across the state. I believe our total number would be, uh, I haven't tracked it specifically today, but you know, close to uh, 50. I wanna put that in contrast to, to date, 178,000 cases in colleges across the country. In terms of outbreaks, though we continue to follow a number of small number incidents, the one I will focus on again this morning is the outbreak of COVID-19 among seasonal workers at Champlain Orchards. Reported on this previously and earlier this week, and continue to say that it is contained to this site. There's no risk to the public from apples, the workers, or the staff. And again, if you've been apple picking in the past couple of weeks or visited the farm stand, you are not at risk either. Since Tuesday, when I last reported, another round of testing has occurred and one more worker has tested positive which makes a total of 28 positive cases. But all but one of those 28 are among a group of 29 workers who travel together, work together, and live together on the farm. The only other worker testing positive had close contact with that group, but lived in separate housing. At this time, no one is hospitalized. Since we learned of the first case last weekend, our health department team has been working closely with the owners of the orchard, the Agency of Agriculture, the Open Door Clinic, and Porter Hospital in Middlebury, and the town of Shoreham to see that the affected workers are well supported. As you know, the workers who tested positive are in isolation, meaning that they live together as a group in one housing unit and continue to work together as a group in the orchard separate from others as they have been done, so long as they're feeling well. Two other groups of workers determined to be close contacts were quarantined. This means they also live together and work together as a separate group. All of them tested negative on day seven and they no longer need to quarantine. In terms of supports, workers will have access to paid sick leave either through the Families First Coronavirus Relief Fund or paid by the employer for those in quarantine or isolation. The owners of the orchards, state agencies and partners have been working together to make sure these workers have what they need, whether they're quarantining or isolating. Right now, the best solution for housing is on site, but should the need change, the State Emergency Operations Center stands ready to provide alternate housing. Also, with funding from the state, 
The orchard has been providing and will be purchasing food for the workers so they don't need to go into town to buy groceries. Contact less thermometers and supplies of face masks have been, del masks have been delivered, plus a number of calling cards and cell phones so workers can use the WhatsApp to enable workers to communicate with loved ones back home. And, if needed, have telemedicine consults with the Open Door Clinic. We've made connections to make sure hospitals know there's coverage for all Vermonters who are seeking tests and treatment for COVID, regardless of their insurance status or immigration status. Now, for years, we've had people living and working in Vermont who are uninsured, and because they are not citizens of the U.S., do not qualify for Medicaid. And as I said, thankfully, none of these workers are hospitalized now or in need of medical care at this time, but there is assistance available if needed. The health care system has not left these workers out in the cold. They're essential to our economy and important members of our communities. Some of the H-2A workers employed at Champlain Orchards have actually worked in Vermont for decades. Free and referral clinics for the uninsured in Vermont provide care for these individuals, and hospitals have built programs that cover the care for those who do not have health care coverage. With this pandemic, there is now a federal program for health care providers and hospitals to submit claims for uninsured individuals who require testing and treatment for COVID-19. Providers can be reimbursed for the cost of delivering testing and treatment for COVID-19, and they do not need to verify immigration status to be eligible to receive reimbursement. Perhaps as testimony to the longevity of some of these workers coming back and forth to Vermont, the community, it should be noted, has also responded to their needs with generosity, providing food and donations. Finally, the health department is conducting another round of testing at the orchard today, and depending on results, the orchard may be reopened to the public as early as Saturday. I'll turn it back to the governor. Thank you, Commissioner Levine. We'll now open it up to questions. Thank you, Governor. Probably a question for Dr. Levine. Um, Dr. Levine, the um, experimental drugs that President Trump is taking, I'm wondering what, what do we know about them? And uh, also, I understand it's for Generon, but I believe it's one of the ones he's taking as well. He says it should be free to every American. Um, is, is that feasible, seeing how it's still experimental? So President Trump received a total of three uh, treatments that were aware of. I believe Regeneron is the company, uh, but it's a uh, antibody cocktail, if you will, uh, antibodies to the virus. It's been involved in uh, trials, which I'm told are promising, though I've not seen the data. Uh, it may be within weeks of actually getting emergency use authorization, but it hasn't as of today. Um, and it was uh, used in the president, um, I won't say experimentally, because there was some evidence that it could be successful, but uh, unclear what the indicated audience is for it. You know, what course in the disease it's best applied, what severity level of disease it's uh, best provided. Uh, certainly, I don't think it's been considered to be something that should be uh, given en masse to a population many of whom will actually get better without it and not require it. The second drug he received is remdesivir, which has been very effectively studied by now um, over the course of these six months and does have, play a role for sure. And Vermont hospitals have actually received shipments of that from the federal government over the last number of months. Now the government is no longer providing it, but the hospitals can order it directly from the company. Uh, so that's becoming more of a standard of care in the hospitalized patient. The third thing he received is a potent corticosteroid called dexamethasone. And dexamethasone 
um, is specifically listed for people at the more severe end of the illness range. Um, and generally, those people are going to be in a hospital and perhaps even in the intensive care part of the hospital. Um, we have no notion of the parameters that his physicians use to determine he should receive that. And generally, when you receive that, you're probably in the hospital for a while longer. And as we're aware, his hospital stay was rather truncated. And he got that and then started to uh, go to the outpatient setting and kept taking it there. Uh, so those are the three drugs. Um, and certainly, the dexamethasone data is looking very good uh, for that, again, severe end of the spectrum usually used to treat that inflammatory response of the body to the virus. It's not actually eradicating the virus. It's treating the body's exuberant inflammatory response, which can make people very ill. Are we using dexamethasone here in Vermont? Yes. And, then I just and remdesivir. Okay. And then just one question, actually, for Secretary Smith as well. It has to do with child care policy. Um, as you said, you know, we're, we're not seeing cases and widespread uh, outbreaks in schools, meaning in theory we are able to close down some of these child care hubs. Uh, as I understand it, a lot of the workers, um, they still have to stay on standby, though, just in case there are flare-ups in schools. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if the workers, when they're on standby, if they're allowed to return to their normal everyday jobs or sort of what, what that holding period looks like to them? Yeah, I don't know if I'm going to be able to answer your question precisely, but just let me answer it broadly and we'll, we'll go from there and maybe I can follow up with you on, on the preciseness of uh, your question. The, the Hub Initiative focuses, as you had mentioned, on remote learning days. When remote learning days um, uh, when, when there are remote learning days, then the hubs sort of went into action. I do want to mention, um, just so that everybody knows, we have uh, uh, stood up 40 school age child care hubs at 97 different locations, uh, serving approximately 5,600 children. Our bogey was um, our revised bogey was 6,000, so we're almost there at the revised bogey. But um, as schools bring back children for in-person days, uh, we anticipate, a, as you had mentioned, Calvin, a decrease in the need for school-aged hubs. Um, the team has surveyed active and um, active and asked about the capacity to reopen again if there was a need to reopen in a month or two uh, because a school had closed or, or gone to remote learning. Um, we have heard back that almost all the hub partners and have a sense that they could reopen if they, uh, if they had to close and then a resurgence of COVID uh, warranted it. An example, this might be an after-school program that operated a full-day program uh, for remote learning and then could shift back to serving students after school. So use those employees for after school, um, an expanded after school program, why we wait this out and see how it's going to go, but potentially shift back to the full-day model um, if we needed to shift back to the full-day model. At DCF right now is talking uh, with the hubs about space uh, they've used and how to assure that we will have availability if needed with this sort of period as we're transitioning now um, back and forth. We also continue to work with communities and partners where there is unmet needs. Um, there still may be needs that have been unmet and we may need to have hubs and employees at those uh, those various hubs before. And I, and I said, as I've said, I think at least two or three times, the landscape isn't static out there. So um, as the school year unfolds and schools move towards more, fewer, uh, uh, more or fewer in-person uh, days due to circumstances on the ground, we'll be as flexible as possible. So there still is a need uh, for these uh, hubs 
for maybe expanded after school programs and using them in that regard as we move forward. But still, it's too early to sort of um, claim victory and, and shut down a, a system that I, I've just got to say this, a remarkable effort to put up a system in about 30 days um, with uh, all these hubs, you know, um, in 30 days there was like 30 some odd hubs at 70 locations, a little past 30 days, and there are now 40 hubs at 97 different locations serving, you know, 5,600 people. Incredible effort. Um, but we're just going to have to be flexible, as I said last time. Thank you. Steve? <laughs> um, so Vermont being what it is in the fall, it's not a stretch to uh, imagine lots of trips from Massachusetts and maybe some of the more concerning areas trying to sneak up for day trips and that sort of thing. Wondering um, with the understanding that hotels and restaurants are in dire need of business, um, how uh, closely is the state monitoring um, people that might come in that opt to quarantine by the state's guidelines, but do not. And um, with that knowledge, what is, I guess, the state's approach sort of moving forward? Well, again, as I've uh, acknowledged, we don't have a perf uh, perfect system out there, um, but our modeling, our travel guidance is uh, fairly well known at this point. If you're from a green county, you're welcome to come to Vermont without quarantining. If you're from uh, any other color, uh, you have to quarantine. And uh, so our hope, uh, again, is that people adhere to the guidelines. I know the lodging industry has been a great partner in that respect, uh, and uh, as well, uh, restaurants uh, taking down information, making sure that they're keeping everyone distanced properly, and the re reduced capacity uh, has been beneficial for, uh, in terms of the positive case results. Um, but it hasn't been positive for their bottom line. And, uh, and I'm uh, very concerned about the hospitality sector in general. And that uh, includes lodging, uh, includes restaurants. Uh, I believe we're going to have to have more aid uh, for them uh, to make sure that they can survive uh, through this winter season because this has been more prolonged than anybody uh, had anticipated. Uh, but we're going to have to do everything we can as a state uh, but as well, we're going to need Congress uh, to take some action as well uh, to provide more resources for, for these businesses because this is going to be a, a long winter for them. Uh, and it's, um, to, to your last point there, uh, it sounds like there might be a little more life breathed into at least the possibility of a deal between the White House and Congress. Um, are you continuing to, to keep a close eye on that? Have you heard if you've got a shot against something else? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's difficult uh, to monitor what is happening and what isn't happening uh, in Washington, uh, but we're hopeful. And I know our congressional delegation, I know Senator Leahy, uh, Congressman Welch, Senator Sanders are all working diligently uh, to provide some relief to the states. Uh, we're all facing the same thing, and we all need some help. So um, I'm hopeful uh, they'll come together, whether it's before the election or after, uh, to come to, to the aid of states. Thank you. Steve. Boy, I don't have anything to say. Okay. All right, we'll go to the phones with Ann Wallace-Allen at BT Digger. Uh, hi, this is a question, um, I think, from Mike Harrington. Um, I'm still hearing from Vermonters who are reporting an array of problems with their unemployment insurance, and um, they're saying that they're still having trouble getting through on the call line. Are you able to tell me about the call volume right now and how long the wait times are? Mr. Harrington. Or I'm happy to, uh, thanks. Um, with regards to our call center, I'm not aware of any issues oh. there. Um, we have, uh, I think, close to 100 agents at any given time. Uh, our call volume, uh, depending on the day and the time, for instance, uh, Mondays, on uh, Wednesdays are our highest times and can see anywhere from 3,000 to 5,000 uh, calls come in. Um, and then on other days, uh, we can have as low as 200 calls on a Saturday to um, 500 to 1,000 calls on, on another day during the week. So to my knowledge, our wait times are still uh, under a minute in most cases. 
Um, that being said, uh, we did stand up some other call centers for different grant programs, uh, and um, I know there have been uh, there have been other wait times. But to my knowledge, there's nothing over um, 10 minutes in terms of a wait time. Um, so in terms of getting through, uh, we are not hearing issues that people are not able to get through, um, and and we receive um, we receive communications on a regular basis. I will also say that our call center um, allows uh, for a chat function as well. Um, we were making some updates to the chat, so it's not uh, on the um, website uh, currently, but it was up uh, and has been up for months and will be going up next week again. Um, and, uh, and then there are other methods as well. So I have not heard of any connectivity issues, but certainly happy to connect with our um, uh, our contractor to make sure. Okay, thanks. Um, and Commissioner, I had one other question. I know this one is hard to answer because um, it probably relies on another stimulus package being passed by Congress, but a lot of people are asking um, what is going to happen after the, the six weeks of $300 payments are over. Um, there's you know, still thousands of people out of work and they're relying on unemployment. Is there anything you can tell them about whether there will be another unemployment insurance supplement uh, for sort of mid-October and later in the fall? If, if there's no stimulus packages or anything else that feds or the state can do? Well, um, so I would also just uh, rem uh, remind folks that the people who are receiving the additional stimulus, like the lost wage assistance program, are also receiving uh, unemployment insurance benefit. So um, the underlying benefit is still available for people. Um, people receive can receive up to 26 weeks of traditional unemployment. They uh, then move to 13 weeks of uh, pandemic emergency unemployment compensation. Uh, and then uh, Vermont is still in an extended benefit uh, period, and there's an additional 13 weeks uh, that come uh, with that extended benefit period. Um, in terms of pandemic unemployment assistance or PUA, um, that program runs to the end of the year. Uh, you know, unfortunately, I, I'm, I don't know where uh, the federal stimulus uh, money will end up or um, whether there's additional benefits that are going to come out. Uh, you know, that really all depends um, on how things uh, shake out in the end. Um, but we are prepared that there um, there could be an additional um, you know uh, benefit like the six hundred dollar benefit uh, that came out originally. Um, but right now, um, to be honest, the, even the LWA benefits right now are paying for back weeks uh, in uh, August and early September. So there actually is no um, current existing benefit uh, additional benefit on top of just general unemployment insurance. Um, and certainly, like you said, that will really depend on, on Congress uh, and the President. Um, so I don't, I don't have an answer at this time. Certainly, it's on, a, it's on the forefront of our minds, for sure. OK. I was asking because the 600 additional benefit was an acknowledgment of sorts that the, the base unemployment benefit isn't really enough for people to live on, it sounds like. Yeah, and, and the uh, Vermont uh, maximum benefit amount is uh, $531 per week based on someone's earnings or whether they are doing, um, they are back to work part time, they could uh, earn something less than that. Um, and so uh, we do, I, you know, certainly I recognize that that is not enough, um, especially for an individual or a family to live on. Um, and unfortunately, that's not how unemployment insurance was designed uh, prior, you know, um, over the over the past decades. Um, it was meant to be a, a, a support system, but not a complete offset of someone's full wage. Um, and certainly recognize that, you know, our, our Vermonters need as much support as we can afford them. Um, there isn't right now a mechanism for the state to um, pay anything on top of that, so it really depends on um, how, uh, how the federal stimulus package uh, rolls out in the end and whether there'll be additional benefits through that package. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Uh, and Thank you. just to run through that again, um, we had the 600 dollar extra um, assistance that was provided by Congress uh, and uh, 
then when that ran out, uh, they weren't able to come to agreement uh, in Congress. And then the president uh, put into effect the FEMA, extra $300. Uh, that was three yeah. weeks. And then there was an additional three weeks on top of that. Uh, but as you noted, that's running out as well. Um, we did take some action uh, with uh, 17 million of uh, federal money that we received uh, with, the, with the work yeah. of the legislature provide another hundred dollars, but that's uh, not enough either. So um, a bottom line is we need Congress uh, to come together uh, with the administration to provide uh, some more relief, we believe. That's why I asked if there was some other way, instead of waiting for Congress to come up with another stimulus package, because FEMA came up with that money. Right. Um, we, don't, we don't have the capacity, as, as uh, I noted, that was you know, we, I'd, uh, I'd asked for 20 million, we received 17 million uh, with the, in negotiation with the legislature, but that doesn't go very far. I mean, when you think about that's only $100 a week and that's going to run out in just a, a few short weeks. So it's a lot of money um, that, uh, that would have to be provided and we just simply don't have the resources to do that. Okay, thank you. Lisa Loomis, Valley News. Hi, thanks for taking my call. I'm a reporter. Set the record straight. Um, my question, I think, is for Secretary Curley. I'm wondering how long businesses that successfully completed the grant applications through ACCD before um, applications were stopped. What's the process for them to receive the funding? How long will they wait for that funding? Do you know which which? Uh... I'll let Secretary Curley answer the question, but uh, which relief package were you were you pointing the towards? The one that came out in early summer and then uh, I think it was July maybe. And the legislature, when the legislature returned to, to session, changed some of the parameters and other businesses were allowed to apply. And some businesses made it in before the cutoff and others didn't. Those who completed their applications making it in before the cutoff What's their timing on receiving funding? Uh, Secretary Curley. I'm assuming Secretary Curley's on, but if not, Lisa will get back to you on that. I, I know there's a number of different programs. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, wait a second. Oh, sorry. Um, can you hear me? Yes. So, sorry. Um, so Lisa, I think what you're asking is, is for employers to, or, or businesses that applied for the first round of grant funding, um, they, they got an application in, but the money ran out before they received any money, any grant money. You're wondering when, when and how they might get money out of the second round? Is that your question? My question is, no, businesses that didn't qualify for the first round because they didn't meet the legislature's parameters. And the okay. legislature changed those parameters and a bunch of businesses applied again. For businesses that okay. applied in a timely fashion, for that sec when the parameters change, what when can they expect to leave? Um, so for this, so the parameters were changed for the second round of funding. And that um, grant system is being uh, modified as we speak so that we can serve the businesses that didn't qualify, weren't eligible in the first round. There were um, a variety of, of reasons they might not have qualified. For example, if they were not um, in business long enough, or maybe they didn't meet the 50% threshold. So those uh, folks, if they applied already in the first round and, and were not deemed eligible, um, we're trying to determine whether they'll have to apply again, but that system is not ready to accept the applications and, and to be reviewed at that point. Or at this point, I should say. So it's possible businesses that have applied will have to reapply. How will they be notified of that? Well, we would we would either send an email out or we will make sure that it's, it's broadly made, made known. Um, the governor, I would imagine, would make an announcement when those systems are ready to go live. But we're looking at probably the end of October at the earliest. But we will we will make a point to be sure that that's um, made very apparent to the public. Great, thank you. Great, thanks. Joel Lee, Local 22. Hi, Governor Scott. 
um, I wanted to ask about Governor Whitmer. Um, have, uh, have you yourself seen an increase in negativity or possible threats following lockdown restrictions over the past few months? Uh, you mean here in Vermont? Right. Mm -hmm. um, we, uh, we receive uh, a variety of uh, different uh, correspondence with people who aren't uh, happy. Um, and I, I don't believe we talk about that a whole lot, uh, but I might refer to Mr. Sherling uh, for a, a better response than that. Thank you, Governor. Uh, good morning, folks. Um, generally, uh, there are threats made annually to elected and appointed officials. Um, we don't discuss the details of those threats or the threat posture. Uh, I'm not familiar with any specific increase uh, in volume that relates to recent events specific to Vermont. And uh, I wanted to know, have we been able to um has Governor Scott been able to speak with Governor Whitmer? Ha have not uh, at this point in time. I mean, this was unfolding uh, over the last uh, 24 to 48 hours. And uh, again, uh, we want to make sure that uh, they know we're thinking of them. Uh, I think all governors, the National Governors Association and others uh, send their uh, best wishes and, uh, and very happy uh, that uh, law enforcement was able to intercede. Uh, to uncover this plot. Uh, it seems as though after reading, I did go through the affidavit and uh, it's, uh, it's interesting uh, what, I mean, this was a real plan. And uh, for law, law enforcement, the FBI and state officials uh, to, uh, to embed people into that organization and uh, to thwart this plan uh, was, uh, was uh, remarkable in some respects. But uh, again, this is a, a time for us all uh, to take uh, take heed and uh, and to try and tamp down uh, this rhetoric and uh, polarization that we're seeing throughout the country. Uh, this is this is unacceptable. Um, we should be uh, we should be taking action uh, through the the polls, the ballot boxes, uh, and not with violence. Thank you so much, Joe. The Barton Chronicle. Strangely, I don't actually have a question, but I would like to congratulate Dr. Levine on the recognition he received from the Vermont Medical Society. That's it for me. Well, Joe, maybe you could break that news. I hadn't heard about this recognition. <clears throat> oh, well, the, the uh, Medical Society sent out a press release um, with my luck, it'll be embargoed, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, he, maybe he didn't even know about yeah. it, Joe. You just... Uh... Yes, but, but that's fine. They, they did send it, and uh, he received recognition for his work. Uh, they also recognized Dr. Fowler. Well, both... Uh, um, well, thank you, Joe. Both well-deserved. Yes, I, I quite agree. All right, Henry, VPR. Hi. Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, we certainly can. Thank you. Uh, this is a question for Dr. Levine. Um, according to the owner of Champlain Orchard, as well as several current employees there, the group of workers who arrived in mid-September uh, who's been tested positive, mostly for the coronavirus. Um, they went shopping at local stores the day after they arrived. My understanding is that's not against any guidelines, but uh, Dr. Levine, was your department made aware of that shopping trip as you investigated this outbreak? Um, I'll let Dr. Levine answer that, but from my recollection, that was after the quarantine period that they went shopping, but uh, I'll let Dr. Levine answer that. Thank you. Um, we have gotten various reports from uh, concerned people um, about a shopping visit upon arrival to the state. We did not get that report from the owner of the orchard, I do not believe, and 
uh, as of this morning, because we've had a meeting already, uh, as we do every day about this. Um, my team is basically um, standing by the fact that we are not aware of any shopping visit at the time they should have been quarantined on arrival. And the only shopping visit we're aware of came after uh, that period would have ended. Okay, so the, the owner of Champlain Orchards confirmed to VCR yes, this group did go on a shopping trip the day after they got to Vermont. Um, does that change your thinking at all in terms of considering this outbreak contained? Um, actually not, because as we've said regarding their um, shopping trip afterwards, um, the contact time they had and the number of people they came in contact with and buying the things they needed, which were usually more for cooking, um, did not uh, warrant any major alert for the community or concern on our, on our part that there are contacts who needed to be quarantined in the community. And then just finally, looking more broadly at the essential worker exemptions uh, to some of the quarantine rules for out-of-state travel, um, given that workers are traveling to Vermont, whether from out of the country to work on farms, like in this case, or those that regularly cross the border from counties and other states that have higher case numbers uh, to work in, say, manufacturing facilities, for example, do you have any concerns that this may lead to further infections in the state among specifically workers that are considered essential? You know, we've been tracking this very, very closely, and we have very, very few cases that are related to workers who have come in uh, that are regarded as essential, uh, whether they be coming in for uh, maintenance work on buildings or construction work on highways, what have you. Um, so fortunately, uh, if we use our data, we don't have uh, uh, significant numbers or, or major outbreaks. I will say that um, some sectors have taken their own precautions. I'm aware of some of the hospital sector that has actually looked at the traveling nurse population. And there was a point in time where many traveling nurses were coming from places like Louisiana and Mississippi, which were having very high rates of outbreaks and surges in their cases. And they've on their own elected to do a day zero and day seven testing protocol uh, for such workers. Uh, just to uh, be as totally protective as they can be. Uh, but as I said, the data hasn't supported uh, a lot of infections being brought into the state through the essential workers to this point in time. And the outbreak this week doesn't change your thinking on the guidelines that are in place for essential workers at all? Well, I mean, this, this outbreak, you know, had a quarantine associated with it. So, um, uh, we're, we're very happy about that. And, and these, if you will, are more international travelers than uh, travelers within the country. Thanks. Guy Page. Governor, the Department of Corrections recently discussed with the state of New Hampshire moving our inmates from Mississippi to a nearly empty prison in Haverhill, New Hampshire, but decided against it. Why didn't that work out? Um, I am familiar uh, with uh, looking for different options uh, from the facility in Mississippi. I know that it was uh, the Haverhill one was an option, but for whatever reason, it did not work out. I think uh, Secretary Smith can answer that further, but uh, it just didn't uh, didn't fit uh, our needs at that point in time. Secretary Smith. Um, Guy, thank you. Could thank Secretary, you. Oops, go ahead, sir. No, thank you very much, uh, Guy, for the question. We did look at Haverhill, Mass. Uh, excuse me, Haverhill, New Hampshire, for um, looking at various options at uh, when we were looking. Um, uh, bringing prisoners, uh, bringing inmates back to Vermont. The reason that it, uh, Haverhill didn't sort of meet the needs at the time and could still be a possibility in the future, but we needed something uh, more immediate, 
is that they did not have the medical the medical sort of uh, programs that we needed, did not have sort of the program that we needed within that facility, general programs that we needed in that facility, did not have the MAT program that we needed in that facility. So um, to sort of put all those programs into that facility um, would have been um, would have been time consuming and time that we didn't have. And secondly, um, it would have been um, expensive to do that. What were those programs? The MAT program is the um, uh, the treatment for those with um, substance abuse issues. The medical treatment is uh, the medical treatment that we provide to um, inmates on a regular basis um, in accordance with the uh, with the standards that we have, and some of the programs that we have uh, within the um, uh, the facility, uh, sexual offender programs, those sort of things. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Governor, sure. uh, Governor, we're hearing a lot about multiple COVID-19 diagnoses in the Trump administration. Uh, have any exempt, uh, that is, uh, appointed employees and officials in your administration been diagnosed with COVID-19? Um, Again, I can speak broadly, um, not that I know of. Uh, obviously, there's, there would be HIPAA uh, regulations for uh, preventing me from uh, disclosing them, but, uh, but I'm not aware uh, of any at this point. Uh, would you, obviously you, you couldn't share their names, of course, but would you know about them if they were, there were diagnosis? Is there a I, phone call where you would yeah. know? I would know, yes. Okay, thank you. Andrea, seven days. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Great. Um, I am, um, uh, to follow up on an earlier question, curious about whether there has been any um, kind of guidance from the FBI about ramping up um, security for governors in other states um, following the Michigan incident. Um, again, I will probably let uh, Commissioner Sherling answer that, but I would also say um, we have a, uh, a very uh, good intelligence uh, portion of our, our state police, law enforcement, public safety here in the state, um, and we work hand in hand uh, with our federal partners in, in performing uh, some of those functions. So um, I think we are, uh, we do a pretty good job here of, of maintaining oversight over any threats or anything that's going on in the state at this point in time. Uh, Commissioner Sherling. Uh, thank you, Governor. I think that's a good overview. I would only add that we're in uh, close contact with our federal partners on threat assessment uh, of every type, from election security to uh, dignitary protection, but we don't discuss the details of that. Okay. Um, Andrea, great. Thanks. Um, and uh, I have a second question. This one's for Dr. Levine. Um, I know that uh, Nevada has halted the use of rapid COVID tests, um, the antigen tests in um, nursing homes. And I'm curious about whether the state would kind of, uh, at what point the state would consider that kind of move um, or whether, you know, the, the Han that went out the other week has sort of uh, clarified things. Mr. Levine. Sure, thank you for that question. Just so the broader audience has some context, um, there was a New York Times article regarding uh, the state of Nevada who um, were using antigen tests of uh, the type that the government has been sending out to nursing homes around the country. And because of um, unanticipated results, we'll call that, both on the false positive and the false negative side, has decided to halt the use of those in those facilities. Um, we, we stand very much by what's in the Han, and, um, and I urge people to read that New York Times article uh, because it's essentially what we've been saying in Vermont uh, historically and currently. 
uh, regarding the antigen tests. But again, it's not saying, we are not saying we should never use antigen tests. Um, the article and what we've been saying is very good about pointing out that it's the clinical circumstance that the test is used in that really counts. And putting the thought behind that, as opposed to just using them because they happen to be there and be available. Understanding the prevalence of virus in your own state and your communities, uh, and for bigger states, you know, the regions of the state and understanding before you even administer the test to one of the residents of a nursing home or to one of the staff of the nursing home, what is the pre-test likelihood that that person would have a positive or negative test? If they're in a place that has very little coronavirus going on in the state, it's going to be very low likelihood. As we've said, those settings are just microcosms of what the greater community looks like. And if you came out with a positive test, you'd want to really question, is that a true positive test or not? Because it would be unanticipated. Likewise, if you're in a place that's having a surge and you had a patient with symptoms in the nursing home and they came back negative, you might say, I wonder if that's really a true negative and maybe I should confirm that with a PCR to see if that patient really does have COVID because it has such big implications about what I do with the staff and the residents of that nursing home and how I cohort them, isolate them, et cetera. So again, um, it's unfortunate Nevada uh, had the experience it did, and that's why we're being very, very careful and deliberate about uh, how we choose to use these uh, as these machines start coming into the state. But I will say what I've been saying for months now, these tests do have a role and it's a matter of making sure that they uh, fill that role appropriately and not that they either just get used or not get used. It's uh, got to be a very thoughtful um, enterprise. Thank you, Dr. Ovi. Uh, Dr. Wilson Ring, the AP. Um, hi, happy Friday. Governor, thinking again about the Michigan situation, I won't re-ask the same questions that have been already asked, but as Vermont's uh, highest elected official and probably most publicly known official, do these, when you hear these types of things, I mean, do they scare you or frighten you personally? Uh, no, no. Um, I, I think it's, it disappoints me in a lot of respects um, that what we're seeing, again, across the country in terms of this polarization, this rhetoric, uh, the lack of role models we have, um, and it's just disappointing. Um, but for my own uh, safety, I'm, I feel I'm in good hands. I have a great uh, deal of, of uh, respect and, um, and, uh, and for our law enforcement community, and I, I feel very well protected. Okay, great. And a simple, well, I don't know if it's simple, but a follow-up question on a completely different topic. What do you think of the tone of the lieutenant governor's race? Um, again, I, I, um, I personally, I've run my uh, campaigns uh, differently uh, than many uh, throughout uh, the last 20 years. Uh, I try and talk about what I can bring to the table. I've never run a negative campaign in my life. I've never sent any negative mailers. I've never done any of that. Uh, but I've had plenty uh, sent uh, back to me uh, or against me. Um, so. I've, uh, I've seen that side of things. Um, and it isn't always effective. Sometimes it's effective, otherwise they probably wouldn't be using it. But, uh, but again, for the most part, when you compare it to, to what we see on a, on a national level, uh, I think it's, uh, it's fairly tame uh, compared to what we're seeing again uh, throughout the country, which is disappointing. Um, okay, great, thank you very much. Eric, the Times Argus. Yes, this is for Secretary French. Uh, a month into the school year, what issues are schools still dealing with? What challenges are they facing? What kinks are they trying to work out, if any? Yeah, thanks, Eric. Um, I think it's it's one thing to, uh, you know, the effort that we put into open schools is one activity, but then to keep them open is a, is a separate, and that's where a lot of the effort is now. It's not. I don't want to think of it as sort of a linear progression where it's sort of like we reopen school and mission accomplished and we move on. 
Uh, it's a constant attention to those basic elements that we've gone over and over again about, you know, uh, washing your hands, staying at home if you're sick and so forth that really allow us to continue. So um, I know schools certainly, uh, you know, that's sort of the baseline assumption today that they have to maintain safe operations and that re requires continuous attention to those details. But many now are, are pivoting, uh, as we see it with more in-person instruction, but really pointing their systems to start to address uh, the impact of the emergency on students, and that's that's where the work before us now lies. And I think uh, it's too soon to predict how successful we'll be in that regard. But I know the system is is quickly moving towards focusing on that important issue. And is broadband still a problem? And is anything being done to try to address that? Yeah, we still have many of the last mile issues uh, that existed prior to the emergency uh, still remain. Uh, we've made some progress over the summer. Um, you know, with with our efforts and some of the federal dollars, uh, we still have a lot more work to do as a state. I, I would argue as all rural states, um, and it's going to require additional federal dollars to really to, to tackle some of those more perennial uh, last mile issues in such a rural state like Vermont. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you. Steve, NEK TV. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? We can. Uh, thanks. Uh, one for the governor and one for the doctor, if I may. Um, uh, governor, oh, congratulations on your uh, on your debate uh, for Wednesday. Um, uh, governor, uh, now that we know the risk and the uh, and, and especially the risk to certain demographics of older folks and stuff like that. Instead of waiting for you know Washington to come up with some kind of a, a solution uh, or, or or higher payments or whatever, um, couldn't you just uh, consider uh, opening the spigot uh, a little more to uh, let the economy uh, get going again and uh, and the people who you know who know know the risk like older folks would uh, you know tend to uh, avoid places you know that that would be uh, of higher risk well you know we've opened uh, the spigot a great deal over the last few months uh, there's not too many uh, other opportunities to have significant uh, uh, advantage in some respects i mean we we just recently went to 100 percent in our lodging facilities we had campgrounds at 100%. Um, we had uh, marinas and so forth at 100%. We're back to manufacturing is 100%, construction 100%. Um, there just isn't that many other opportunities. We, uh, the shortcomings are in uh, the restaurants uh, in particular. But what we're seeing uh, is that uh, regardless of what we do, uh, we opened up again uh, lodging to 100%. And I, I still go by uh, some of the uh, motels and hotels and see empty parking lots uh, because people just aren't traveling. We see this in uh, the number of, uh, of, uh, of cars coming into the state uh, as well as leaving. We see this in uh, the amount of uh, air traffic uh, right now. Uh, that's significantly down from where we were a year ago. So regardless of what we do, uh, people just aren't traveling as much. And, uh, and fortunately, unfortunately, uh, we live in a beautiful state where tourism is uh, really important to us. It's one of our largest sectors, and uh, that's having an effect uh, on the hospitality sector in particular. And when you look at the unemployment numbers, uh, most of that, uh, most of that, is uh, connected uh, to the hospitality sector, which is why I said earlier, we need to help them. We need to help them survive in some way. But just opening them up, if we open it all up tomorrow, I don't think that would help a lot because people just aren't traveling, they aren't utilizing, they're not, um, uh, they don't feel confident enough uh, to uh, to go out like they used to, nor should they. Sure, and speaking of air travel, um, with the uh, with the outbreak uh, of the workers from Jamaica, um, was uh, I, I'm sure they didn't travel up here on a private jet. Um, was there contract tracing for all the folks who were like exposed or on flights with uh, w with these folks? Uh, 
on their journey from Jamaica to, uh, to Shoreham? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure of the details. I do know uh, they flew into, I believe, JFK uh, and then took a bus, uh, a private bus, I believe, uh, to Vermont at that point and then uh, quarantined for 14 days. So adhering to the, the guidance that we put into place. But uh, uh, Dr. Levine, anything else to offer? Do you have another question for Dr. Levine? Uh, uh, yes, Governor. Thank you, right. if I may. Let me just um, let me just finish yeah, up with that one quickly, okay, Steve? Um, so, sure, whenever you. there is something like uh, cases, um, people that have been on a plane, uh, there is a special CDC uh, program, uh, electronic data system, uh, that this goes into, so that you know, obviously, our Vermont contact tracers don't know, you know where these people are who were on the plane with them, etc. Um, although I'm not aware that there were other passengers, but certainly there was crew. Um, and so there are mechanisms in place so that things that occur post-travel can be traced back. And if indeed anything needs to be done with people uh, for contact tracing purposes or advice given to them, that all actually gets initiated once we know about the first case. So you can rest assured that um, people who need to know, know. Uh, sure, and uh, a couple more if I may. The, uh, uh, much has been made about, uh, about the president supposedly being reckless and whatnot. Um, yet, on the other hand, we see that the, the governor of Virginia, who is an MD, I believe, himself, um, had adhered to the strict protocols with the masks and everything else. Yet the governor of Virginia himself came down with uh, with COVID. Um, how, is there a way to explain something like that? Yeah, it's the fact that um, the virus is amongst us. It's in the air we breathe, and you can try to be as careful as you can be, and hopefully do very well. Uh, but there are going to be times that people um, contract the virus, and won't even be able to determine how that happened. Um, so I don't know much about the circumstances of the governor of Virginia in terms of uh, you know what kind of background uh, history there was before he turned positive. Um, but you know it, it can happen is all I can say. Um, clearly with, in the president's case, um, I don't need to say much more. I mean, there were there were many many instances that uh, the public health community and uh, the press have already raised regarding um, not being as stringent with the basic routine guidance that we talk about. Um, so. Sure. Um, and on the CDC's website, um, it, I was reading about the uh, certifiers using their best medical judgment. Uh, to determine with a reasonable degree of certainty um, in terms of like probable or presumed shouldn't be reported. Um, yet they mention um, that the current estimates indicate uh, 20 to 30 percent of the death certificates have issues uh, with the completeness. They say that it doesn't mean they're inaccurate, but the higher quality info say, they say can provide a better picture of what's happening. And I guess they didn't start uh, using uh, tests on all deaths until September 1st. Um, if we've got an error rate of, uh, of, of 20 to 30 percent on the death certificate, um, do you think that could contribute to uh, to, uh, to higher or, or, or inaccurate numbers of the uh, COVID deaths? Uh, perhaps nationwide, if I could stand up for Vermont for a second, though. Um, sure. Number one, we have a uh, electronic death reporting system that has almost a tutorial associated with it and allows physicians to really understand how to fill a death certificate out um, because it's something that's actually so important, not just for public health purposes, but for all kinds of individual use purposes for the family of the decedent as well. 
and, uh, and for learning in the, in the clinical community. So it has a lot of purposes. Um, but the bottom line is I'd like to think that all of our clinical people are well trained in using death certificates and filling them out in a comprehensive fashion. Second point is that uh, ever since I can remember way early in this pandemic, uh, our medical examiner's office uh, has been routinely applying uh, the COVID test when it seems appropriate or whether there was no other explanation for the cause of death. And many who um, were um, in, in the position of filling out a death certificate uh, often were able to uh, obtain a specimen um, from the decedent so that that base would be covered more or less. And that goes for many of our nursing home patients who have passed away, um, some of whom might not have been suspected to have had COVID uh, but were tested uh, at the time of death. So um, while there probably, you know, this would lead to an underestimate nationally because as you're alluding to, uh, people wouldn't be recognized as having COVID as part of the mix. Um, I'd like to think in Vermont, we're, we're pretty strict about it and uh, have a pretty accurate assessment. All right, we've got yeah, to do I was thinking that. All right, great, thank you very much. Sure. We've got to move to Avery at WCAX. Yeah. My question is for a doctor looking in about PCB uh, contamination at Burlington High School. How do you balance the medical risk um, from PCB contamination with the academic, social, and emotional impact of students who are now learning entirely remotely? Yeah, that's a question that's come off, uh, come up a lot lately. To be clear, there are two types of medical risks. People are focused very much on the cancer risk, uh, which does take much time to develop and um, usually doesn't turn up like, right away, and uh, for which we are very strict and very conservative, I would say, in Vermont as we set our uh, detection levels. But there are other risks that have to do with uh, non-cancer, but still medical risks. Some of them have to do with the immunolo immunologic system, how we fight off infections. Some have to do developmentally uh, with the fetus uh, with regard to neurologic development and behavioral development. Some have to do with the endocrine glands like the thyroid or uh, diabetes. Um, so there's a, a whole host of those and those generally do not take that same time frame to develop. Uh, you know, with cancer, we call it a latency period. You get exposed to something, like, let's say tobacco. Uh, generally, people don't die of lung cancer in the second year of smoking. It's decades later because of that latency period. Same thing uh, can potentially occur with the PCBs. So the non-medical risks, the non-cancer uh, risks occur much more quickly in time. Second thing, and uh, uh, that's being raised is, you know, uh, the other forms of health of those who can no longer enter the building. So their emotional health, their social development. Um, those are, you know, their mental health. Those are all very important. Uh, no one is minimizing those at all. I do think it's a little bit of a false equation here to try to balance one versus the other and say, well, it's much worse uh, if they got cancer, you know, in 10 years, but in the meantime, they could have been more successful in school if you'd let them in the school, but you didn't let them in the building. The good news here is that I know through the superintendent and other members of the academic community there that they're making very uh, honest efforts to try to find other solutions so that it won't have to be permanently remote learning. And I think that's very, very important. The other thing I think is important is that it's not only the students who are in school. There are staff who work there, whether they're in the cafeteria or custodial staff or administrative staff in the offices. There are teachers who work there. There are instructors of other sorts. Many of them 
aren't just in school for six to seven hours a day uh, on the days that school is in session for a couple of years. Many of them are there for eight or 10 hours uh, on in-service days as well as regular school days and for 20 or 30 years. So we have to think about the risk to them as well. Uh, and though we of course prioritize kids and kids' health and we're always focused on uh, the development of kids and we don't want to take the focus off of that, we can't forget these other people either. Does that answer your question? It does. And just a quick follow-up. You mentioned some solutions that the school system was working on. Has the state identified any course of action that will get the, like, the least risky parts of VHS open again in the near future? Um, maybe I'll ask Secretary Moore if she's on the line. Um, because that has more to do with uh, the buildings themselves, you're saying, right? Right. I believe Secretary Moore is on the line. I am, I'm sorry. Did you want to repeat the question, Avery? Please, that would be helpful. Sorry, I was muted there. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, has the state identified any course of action that will get the least risky portions of Burlington High School open again in the near future? Uh, we are continuing to work with the consultants um, that are that the high school has engaged to understand the, the scope. Uh, the full scope of the issues that would need to be addressed in order for the school to reopen. Um, the, the school was closed as a result of, of indoor air quality concerns, um, but we're awaiting a full set of sample results, not only for the, the building materials that appear to be the source of the contamination, but also um, soils outside the building. So that is very much a working process. Okay, thank you. Aaron, VT Digger. Do you think that Vermonters can and maybe should do to prevent um, threats like the ones that occurred in Michigan? Could you repeat that, Aaron? You're a little bit broken up. Oh, sorry. Um, can you hear me more clearly now? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. Um, what what do you think Vermonters should do to prevent threats like the one that occurred in Michigan? Well, again, they didn't occur in Michigan. Um, they um, they almost they, occurred. Right? By, yeah. No, I mean, I'm just my point is. Uh, law enforcement, uh, the FBI, uh, along with state police and so forth, uh, were able to thwart that effort. And uh, and I would uh, maintain that uh, I have a great deal of faith and trust and confidence in our law enforcement here in Vermont. Uh, I know they work diligently on issues like this, trying to maintain um, some sort of surveillance, so to speak, on on what's happening on social media. Uh, but. Um, but and we need to continue that. Uh, that's an ongoing effort, uh, a daily effort. And I have, uh, again, a great deal of respect for those who are doing just that. Um, but from each and every one of us uh, has a responsibility to be vigilant, uh, to make sure that we're aware of what's going on, um, either uh, what we see and report that. Uh, but also, uh, it's just, again, uh, I want to stress where we are today as a country where we're so polarized, we're so divided. Um, we need to heal that, uh, and we do that uh, by being better people, by being better role models, uh, to to tamp down the rhetoric, uh, to trying to find ways uh, to work together. And, uh, and it doesn't mean that we don't disagree, uh, but it does mean uh, that we do so civilly and respectfully. Uh, there's a way to affect change, uh, and it's through, again, the ballot box or uh, running for office or or, or you know, petitioning your government, um, but it isn't through violence. And uh, that's something uh, that we need to continue to be vigilant. And, uh, and, and that's, uh, 
you know, from my standpoint, that's the line. That's the line, the sand. And you don't cross that, regardless of what's your, your displeasure. Uh, violence is unaccept uh, unacceptable. Thank you. Um, and just to be clear, uh, when you say they should report that, um, where, how, how can the lockers report um, anything they might see or hear? Um, I'll, uh, Commissioner Sherling, uh, maybe you could answer that. Certainly, uh, this goes along the lines of the uh, uh, posters and things you'll see everywhere around. See something, say something, which will uh, prevent uh, violent acts from happening across an array of different concerns. And you can call your local or state law enforcement. Uh, there are tip lines uh, available. Um, but the, the easiest call is just to call uh, whichever law enforcement agency covers your area to report something suspicious. Thank you. I, uh, I also have a question for Dr. Bean to follow up on your comment about antigen testing. Um, have at this point any antigen tests actually been distributed for Jews in Vermont? I'm aware that several of our nursing homes have received uh, the machines, the platforms that those are done on, but I don't believe it's gone to all 35 or 37 of those nursing homes yet. Okay. Um, is, is that the, the in, you know, intention uh, is to get all of them to all nursing homes? That was the federal government's intention to provide it to the nursing homes all throughout the country. Um, at, our, at this point in time, uh, we are actually uh, continuing to support those nursing homes with PCR testing. Um, and we've just come out with renewed guidance uh, that uh, needed to be renewed because CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, had come out with more guidance for nursing homes about reopening and facilitating visitation. Much of it is through testing strategies. So we've already developed the testing strategies uh, for the nursing homes that we can work in concert with them on uh, through the end of this year uh, so that uh, they don't need to use the antigen platform currently at this time. Okay, thank you very much. I will also just add quickly that when and if we should use antigen testing in those settings, uh, and we've been very clear about this, um, they would have to be on a repetitive, periodic basis. Could not be just once a month we're going to do antigen tests on everyone in the nursing home. It has to really be done at least weekly, once or twice weekly, uh, with that kind of periodicity uh, to make the uh, reliability of the antigen test uh, as high as it might be. Um, that's all I'll say for now. Thank you. Kat, WCAS. Hi, my question is likely for Dan French. I saw a letter from a school district to parents that warned parents that as we head into so, uh, the winter season, they might have to close schools on short notice due to teachers calling out with cold-like symptoms and not enough substitute teachers to replace them. What is your agency doing to help districts prepare for this or to recruit more substitute teachers? Yeah, thanks. Uh, at the state level, we haven't been directly involved in helping districts with the recruitment of additional substitutes. Uh, but in terms of the communication, I would say I haven't seen it. Um, I think it just points, uh, as I've, I've made the observation, the schools, the, the logistics involved in operating schools are, you know, fairly fragile, if you will. Um, and a big part of logistics is staff availability, which will vary uh, from district to district, if not from school to school. Um, so it's important, you know, I think our biggest contribution to that uh, was baking in by design uh, a certain amount of flexibility into our state planning. Uh, so we've essentially, I think, prepared districts and they've shown their ability uh, to operate in what will be very dynamic conditions and they have the tools, I think, in our guidance to, uh, to make those decisions and be very responsive to their changing conditions. Do you think we have enough substitute teachers to meet school district needs this winter? Uh, no, uh, but I would say we didn't have enough subs prior to the emergency either. It's been a perennial issue and more a function of our demographic challenges as a state. And so then what would be your advice to districts who might grapple with this in the winter? Is it to use snow day protocol? Is it to use, um, 
you know, all remote learning? What's, what's the kind of the, the messaging to them? Well, we've, as I mentioned, uh, we have regular weekly calls with the superintendents, uh, and you know they're very familiar at this point with the operationalizing the guidance that we've created. Uh, so they they are very familiar with uh, the ability to toggle between uh, in person, remote, and so forth. And I expect uh, you know that will be essentially the new normal for the rest of the rest of the school year, not just the winter. Um, in terms of recruitment, I know you know the superintendents of school districts have been very uh, creative in how they recruit. Uh, certainly using different online platforms and, and ads and so forth. Uh, also, I've seen an uptick in uh, requests for the waiver of regulation for school board members themselves uh, to serve as substitute teachers. Uh, typically, school board members are prohibited from being regular employees of school districts, but there's a mechanism in our regulation that allows uh, for districts to request waivers. Uh, so we've been expediting those waiver requests. Uh, so we've had a lot of school board members step up and volunteer uh, or be interested in being subs. So, we're doing everything we, we can, um, but I'm confident we have uh, the plans in place to be as responsive as possible. Thank you. You're welcome. Mike Donahue, the Islander. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, thank you, Governor. Uh, thank you for those words about uh, stability and compromise. Uh, by the way, I did get my flu shot yesterday. Great. Congratulations. Uh, when uh, Secretary Brent spoke earlier today, he talked about kids going back to school, and I think the phrase was, while they still can. What do you know that we don't, as far as the likelihood of another shutdown in the coming months or school, of this school year? Um, I'm not aware of anything other than we don't, you know, it's hard to determine what the virus is going to do. Uh, we, we're doing all we can uh, to protect ourselves against uh, the spread, and uh, we've done a pretty pretty good job of that uh, thus far. Uh, but uh, but again, as we've seen on a national level, and um, sometimes it, it just takes a course of its own. I mean, it, it's not something we we don't have a vaccine to prevent it at this point in time. So I don't know if that's what the Secretary French was talking about, but I'm going to let him answer that. Okay. Uh, thanks, Mike. Uh, no, the phrase I was using referred to uh, maximizing in-person instruction while the conditions remain as positive as they are. Um, and I, I observed, uh, as we started our planning process in June, many of the medical experts that we had brought in made the observation that, you know, really uh, the conditions right now in June at the time were as best as they're going to be. Um, and that just really struck home to me and I think resonates with a lot of educators as well. Uh, we know just coming into the winter, being inside more and so forth, that the conditions are likely to get more challenging. It wasn't really any commentary on, on uh, any prediction of where the virus will go per se, but we just know we're gonna be operating in a more challenging environment. Um, and now's the time to try to do more in, as much in person as we can. Okay, and as a follow up to what you said about sports earlier, um, I'm just wondering what is on the table and what kind of concessions is the state looking to try to have to have some sort of sports this winter. I mean, obviously in the fall, football went to seven on seven. Uh, so what is the conversation to be able to have some sort of basketball? Are you looking at um, three on three? Or are you looking to have contests with just three point or free throw balance contests? I mean, what's been discussed as options to the tr traditional game in yeah. both hockey and basketball? The, um, I use the phrase uh, in my comments about finding a path forward, and I, th I think that's an important uh, phrase because it acknowledges, firstly, that we're, we're putting a priority on trying to make this happen if we can. Um, but then, you know, we walk through a risk assessment of the, the specific sport, um, particularly, as I mentioned, indoor sports are uh, more challenging, I think, for us to uh, resolve the mitigation strategies that might be necessary. I would say, particularly with indoor sports, what I've noticed is a pattern in those deliberations is a consideration of uh, spectators, the number of spectators in the facility and so forth, uh, which presents a, a whole nother level of challenge. But, um, you know, I, I feel confident we have a good decision-making process uh, through that. Um, and as I mentioned, we'll, um, we'll work through this, try to find a path forward and the expectation that we'll publish guidance by the end of October if possible. So you have no, uh alternative to the traditional hockey game or the traditional basketball game 
that you're even considering at this point is the no discussion. It's how to limit the crowd, maybe. No, there's many variables being considered. Once again, we start with the assumption that we'd like to uh, offer the sport, um, and then we start to go through a risk assessment process to understand how we might mitigate uh, the risks that are involved. But we look at all aspects. I just use the example of uh, spectators as just one of many variables that are being assessed. But I guess I'm just wondering, what are the alternatives? I know you go through risk assessments. I mean, that's what we've been doing since March on everything. What yeah. are the alternatives that you can seeing, may see? I think we just have to wait till the guidance comes out and we'll see see how we navigated those risks and the, the assessment. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Andrew, Caledonian Record. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Governor. Um, I guess in the spirit of the topic that Mike was just on, um, and in full disclosure, I have a personal interest in my question, but it's a big enough topic in this area that I think it's worth asking. Um, our region learned this week that the community ice arena would not be opening for the season due to um, COVID-related financial challenges uh, and concerns about the viability of the upcoming hockey season. Um, this affects three high school teams, a large youth hockey program, and countless community members. Um, first, uh, does the state have $75,000 in COVID relief funds lying around uh, and they want to come to the rescue. Uh, and second, is the state doing enough to provide uh, community assets like recreational facilities, cultural institutions, nonprofits um, that are often volunteer run passion projects as opposed to traditional businesses uh, with the info assistance and financial support they might need to survive? Yeah, obviously uh, another concern for us, along with the uh, hospitality sector, uh, some of those community nonprofits and so forth, we have had uh, resources available to them um, and uh, have, have, uh, have actually uh, uh, provided uh, those resources uh, to many of them, uh, but it's, we know it's not enough. Um, that's why I continue to say uh, we could use some more help from, uh, from Congress. Um, but um, but I, in, in direct response to your question, um, I may ask Secretary Curley uh, to respond as well, but, um, but we will uh, go through the next uh, month, month and a half uh, or so, and determine if there's any uh, money that hasn't uh, been released uh, that could be utilized for other purposes. Uh, and uh, hospitality is, is a sector that I, I think we'd want to con uh, concentrate on, uh, but we would consider other options as well. So um, I. I would say uh, talk with, uh, uh, engage with those at uh, ACCD and, uh, and at least uh, be there as a, a provision if we do have, um, have excess uh, funds available. Secretary Curley, is there anything that you can add to that? Yeah, um, that, that's great, Governor. I, I just want to mention that, uh, you know, specific to hockey arenas, there are hockey arenas that are operating currently. They're operating uh, very nicely within our guidelines. We've provided a lot of guidance to them and, and help them through. So if we can do that with the rate that you're referring to, we're happy to do that. We also, um, we do provide grants, economic recovery grants to recreational, nonprofit, um, a variety of folks. So again, if, if you think your your rate has suffered a lot or your, you know, whatever it may be, a field or rate, an organization has suffered a loss of, um, uh, actually, at this point, our grants have changed a little bit before we needed a 50% loss. But um, certainly reach out to us because there are recovery grants. We're uh, about to launch our second round, and we do want to help. We know that this industry has been hit very hard. The entertainment industry, as the governor has mentioned, hospitality. So um, we're prepared to continue to help folks with this, this federal relief money. All right. I hope that helps. Thank you very much. All right, Liz. Liz Murray, Burlington Free Press. Hi there. Can you guys hear me? We can. Okay. Thank you for taking my question. Um, I this could be either for the governor or Dr. Levine or both. Um, I am. I, I noticed that yesterday was the second time this week that we've seen positive case numbers. Um, or 
in, in the double digits. Yesterday there was a growth of 11 cases in Vermont, which, you know, granted is smaller than the growth that we saw earlier this week. Um, but um, I'm, I'm wondering if this is indicative of a, um, a greater trend that you're seeing or that we're expecting or indicative of what's to come. Uh, again, I think uh, in some respects we've become accustomed uh, to our low positivity rates. We have you know, two or three or four a day, uh, and that's been uh, fairly normal. And now that we get up uh, into the uh, 10, 11, 12 range, it feels like uh, that we're uh, uh, you know there's some growth there. Um, but uh, but again, as compared to other states uh, that are seeing uh, you know um, probably. 10, 20, 30 times, maybe 100 times uh, the number of cases we're seeing uh, a day, even per capita, um, it pales in comparison. So I believe, you know, I have the same concerns. I watch the numbers every single day, and um, but I look to see where they're coming from. Um, you know, the, is it concentrated in one area? Or do, do we have a problem uh, that needs to be rectified? And we talk about this, we have meetings uh, at least three times a week on this uh, with a team of advisors uh, I have uh, to uh, to determine just those very questions. But uh, again, from my standpoint, uh, we have nothing to worry about at this point. Uh, I remain concerned about any elevation in uh, the number of positive cases, but we're still the lowest. Uh, we have the, the lowest number of positive cases per capita uh, in the in the nation, and we still enjoy that uh, today. Dr. Levine, anything to and, and, Anything else? Oh, sorry. I thought Dr. Levine was stepping up to the microphone. Um, I, I wanted to follow up, um, you know, just just at this point, um, you know, the, the numbers are still low, like you said. Um, but when when is the point where we start to get concerned or where you would start to get concerned about what you're seeing? Um, I'll let Dr. Levine answer that. Yeah, so for the first question, I really don't have much to add to what the governor said uh, for your latest question. Um, that's why we have our Tuesday modeling sessions every week, because we have what Commissioner Pichak terms the guardrails, you know, where we get really concerned. So whether it's the number of cases in aggregate, whether it's the number of new cases or the percent growth in new cases, whether it's the change in our percent positivity rate of our tests, whether it has to do with hospitalizations and aspects of the healthcare system, or whether it has to do with the syndromic surveillance, the symptoms that people are having out in the community. Um, we look at all of those things amongst others um, and if there is a trend that's really adverse, obviously we're going to pick up on that very early and um, deliberate about how to manage that. But we have not seen that at this point in time. As my opening comments today alluded to, we are seeing nationally and regionally increases that are concerning us. And the increases we're seeing regionally concern us more than the ones we're having within our borders. But again, we have to watch both very carefully. Thank you very much. Uh, Liz, are you still on? Maybe just a message uh, to Liz. Uh, I understand congratulations are in order. Um, hopefully you haven't been socially distancing for the last week and possibly been in quarantine, but uh, Liz got married last week. Thank you, Governor. We had four people at our wedding, so we haven't had to <laughs> Well, congratulations from all of us. Thank you. I guess, Governor, just your reaction to um, the latest tactic by the protesters in Burlington to go to individual members of the uh, city council who ne didn't necessarily agree with uh, their issue that they had and uh, basically blocking off their street, uh, a couple hundred people coming in and, and shutting things down. Um, 
Is that is that acceptable? Is that too far? Uh, you know, it's uh, it's about uh, remaining a peaceful protest, which it seemed uh, appeared to be uh, from my standpoint uncomfortable. Yes. Um, we all put ourselves in uncomfortable positions when we run for office. Um, it seemed to be somewhat civil, um, but uh, but the violence is the you know red line in the sand, uh, and uh, and I didn't see that. So uh, you know again uncomfortable, but uh, but from what I've seen across the country, uh, it pales in comparison. Uh, I think it's more of a again a local issue, uh, and I know the city council uh, will have to deal with it in any way that they think is necessary. Um, but, um, but again, I'm, I'm very thankful that it's uh, remained peaceful over the last couple of months. But the fact that it has gone to person, so if an individual uh, or a group doesn't agree with, say, a state lawmaker or yourself yeah. or anybody else who may have a family at home with children, and this yeah, kind of thing I mean, happens. admittedly, the line is blurred. I mean, you're affecting your neighbors uh, as well. It's not just about you in particular. It is your family as well as your your neighbors and so forth. So, you know, the line is blurred a bit. Uh, I would just ask people to just be respectful and civil uh, and do so in a manner that uh, you can be a, a model for your kids and, and for others uh, so we can tamp down this rhetoric and so forth. So we just want to make sure that people are heard. Um, that's our our constitutional right, uh, but there's there's ways to do it and uh, be respectful and civil at the same time. That's it. All right. Thank you very Governor, much. Is that Governor? If you have a moment, I'll just drag from the town oh, earlier. Oh, go, uh, go ahead, Greg. Despite offending our SVP and, and responding back uh, yesterday, Greg, Dr. Lavigne needs to go to an interview so if you could get to your question, please. Yeah, if you have, uh, if Dr. Levine has to leave in about two minutes, so if it's a question for him, why don't you fire away? Um, it, it's actually not. Uh, okay. So, uh, You're dismissed. Either for you or uh, Secretary Smith. Go ahead. Um, and we've spoken about some issues in Richford in the past, and um, I just wanted to know if there was an update on what your administration was doing. Uh, I know that the issues kind of settled down there for a while uh, after the state moved a bunch of people out of the area, um, and apparently the local hotel or motel has filled back up again. There's some quality of life issues again. I'm wondering if you could just fill us in on what your administration is working on. Well, again, first of all, we're trying to provide uh, for relief of those families who are displaced and in uh, need of our help and assistance. And uh, and I'll let Secretary Smith answer the rest. Thank you, Greg. As you perhaps know, we um, we have not uh, placed any new clients in that motel in Richford uh, since uh, September 21st. In fact. Um, we are using fewer rooms, and in fact, we've moved uh, several uh, families to other locations in order to make sure that we're meeting the needs of the community at the same time as looking out for those that are homeless. So that's that's the status okay. where, we, where we are. Okay, thanks for that update. I, I was not aware that there were not any new occupants there. Um, did I hear a rumor correctly that the administration or, or someone from the administration is going to meet with local officials on coming up with a better long-term strategy? Right. We have a deputy commissioner who is an uh, interim deputy commissioner who of, uh, of e economic um, opportunity that will be uh, meeting with local officials. I don't know when it is. I think it's real. Sh it's it's shortly, but I don't know when it is. Uh, will that will that meeting be open to the public or open to the media? I I don't know that, Greg. Um, we'll get back to you on that. Okay, thank you. And thanks for the time, Governor. With that, we'll see you on Tuesday. Thank you very much.